Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Sunday morning. I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you are uh, ready and prepared to look into God's Word with me this morning. As we continue our journey through the Gospels, we are going to be staying uh, in John chapter 4 today. We're going to be continuing to explore the interaction that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well. So I'm just going to invite you to pray with me as we begin uh, or continue that journey this morning. Gracious God, we just pray that you would once again uh, bless us with your presence, bless us with an understanding of your word, bless us with with a freshness, uh, a fresh set of eyes, a fresh set of ears to see and to hear what you would say to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So how many of you have ever been part of an uncomfortable conversation? I'm sure you know the kind. You know, the, the ones where no one really wants to talk, right? You kind of, you end up squirming in your seat a little bit. You're, you look desperately around for, for a way out of the conversation or for, for even just a way to change, change the subject. Or, or maybe the conversation, I don't know if you've ever had this situation, maybe the conversation didn't start out uncomfortable, but it kind of became uncomfortable at some point. Uh, maybe someone brought up something that, that suddenly put the break on the conversation, or, or maybe they told a really off-color bad joke, and, and, and everyone in the group just kind of was like, what are you doing? Maybe, maybe someone brings up something really embarrassing, right? Where, you know, you know the, those moments where someone thinks they're being hilarious? Oh, you remember the time you did such and such? And all you can think in your head is, did they really just mention that? I, I can't believe that. This is so embarrassing. Have you ever been in one of those situations? Is that resonating with you at all? Well, as we continue our journey today through John chapter 4, that is what happens in this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Just just listen to how this unfolds. Then the woman said to him, Sir, give me some of this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. So you remember up until this point in the conversation, Jesus had had asked her for a drink of water. She she was coming to the well by herself and and Jesus was there. He was tired from his long journey and and he asked her for a drink of water. And and she kind of scoffs a little and she talks about uh, a Jewish man asking a Samaritan woman for, for water. And Jesus Jesus responds to her with this this kind of veiled, mysterious reference to to living water that he would freely give her if she would only ask for it. And and so she kind of does that here in in verse 15, right? Sure, give me some of this water so that I won't have to keep coming back here to draw water every day. But then Jesus, Jesus makes this statement. Go and get your husband. And and in that moment, the level of comfort in the conversation plummets. It goes through the ground, deeper than the well that they were sitting beside talking. The comfort level all of a sudden gets completely shattered. Because in this one sentence, in this one statement, Jesus, Jesus more or less slap the woman in the face. Because by saying this thing, Jesus exposes her most serious failings, the source of her deepest guilt. When I read this account, every time, I I have this this picture in my head of this woman as Jesus says this to her, and and her face kind of falls open in shock and awe. And, and I even kind of have this image of her kind of stumbling. Her legs get maybe a little bit weak and she kind of half falls and half sits down onto the, the edge of the well that, that she's standing beside. Because Jesus has, has, has spoken to her the one thing that she does not want to talk about. She, she has no interest in having this conversation at all. 
And we know this because of her response. She says to him, I have no husband. Now, if we were reading this for the first time, we, we, we really wouldn't catch the significance of that statement. But, but if we've read it before, we, we understand that that's a flat-out lie. And Jesus, Jesus knows right away. Jesus knows right away that it's a flat-out lie. Jesus sees right through her. He says to her, well, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband at all. What you have just said is quite true. And suddenly, suddenly all pretenses vanish. This kind of light-hearted, bantery conversation that had been going on between Jesus and the Samaritan woman takes a very, very, very deep, serious turn. And this woman all of a sudden realizes that this strange Jewish man who dared to have a conversation with a Samaritan woman has seen directly into her heart and her life. There's an interesting little side note here. See, even after she realizes that Jesus knows her in ways that he should not be able to know her, she still tries to say to change the subject twice after this point in the conversation. We read about the first one in the very next verse. Sirs, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So a recognition of Jesus' obviously spiritual authority and insight. But then she changes the, the subject. Our ancestors, ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She, she tries to redirect the conversation. I don't want to talk about this, so let's go over here and talk about this instead. It's like when your boss calls you into her office to take a strip off of you, and, and halfway through the conversation, you look at her and say, So, um, NFL playoffs are this weekend. Who do you like, the Packers or the Bucks? Just a, a side note, all of you had better been cheering for the Bucks. No, sorry, for the Packers. Just saying. My life goes much better if my wife's team wins and gets to go to the Super Bowl. Just keep that in mind for this afternoon if you're thinking about football at all. Here's the uncomfortable truth that we all must face this morning. Jesus sees through each of us as easily as he sees through this Samaritan woman. Jesus looks at us and knows everything that there is to know about us. Hebrews 4.13 outlines this for us perfectly. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And that's what happens in this moment with the Samaritan woman. Jesus sees everything there is to see. It's all laid bare before him. And in this moment, he calls her to account. And he does the same for each of us. You see, it doesn't matter what your sin is, whether it's the sin of this woman, or the sin of Moses, or David, or Peter, or if your sin is merely the, the disobedience and rebellion that lurks in each of our hearts. He sees it. It doesn't matter what it is. He knows all that you have done. And he has this annoying tendency to name what he sees. And if we're honest, we will often respond to him in those moments in much the same ways that this Samaritan woman does. We will try to dodge the discussion. We... We'll we may try to tell Jesus what we think he wants to hear. Or perhaps, like the woman, we'll, we'll try to tell a bit of a half-truth. Well, I don't have a husband. <laughs> Jesus says, yeah, you're right. The man you're living with right now is not your husband. But you've had five before this. And even though it doesn't work, we try to do the same thing. 
We tell little half-truths. We try to downplay the situation. We may try to outright deflect the situation. Or try and change the subject. Jesus will say to us, I'd really like to talk to you about your lying. Or he might say to us, can we have a chat about the coin you've been stealing from the, the coffee jar at work? Or I'd, I'd love to talk to you about, about the way you're being deceitful with your spouse. And instead, we'll look at him and say, hey, how about them Packers? See, we don't want to have to admit that Jesus knows what he's talking about. Or that there is, there is actually a problem that we need to deal with. You know, as we read through this account, it might seem odd that, that Jesus shifts the conversation to, that, that he changes it. He, he's... He's talking to her about living water and, and a gift from God. And, and then all of a sudden he says to her, go and get your husband. And we might, we might be tempted to, to, to wonder why. Why does Jesus change the subject here? Go and get your husband. What does that have to do with living water? But here's the thing. I don't think Jesus is changing the subject at all. You see, in order to have access to living water, in order to receive the, the free gift of salvation from God, we have to we have to recognize our desperate need for the spiritual life that we don't have. See, living water can only be only be obtained by those who recognize that they are spiritually thirsty. But thirst isn't enough, is it? Salvation only comes to those who confess and repent of their sin and desire forgiveness. You see, my friends, that is the gift of living water that Jesus is promising here. The, the gift that wells up to eternal life. You see, before the immoral woman can embrace the Savior and recognize the Messiah, she has to concede the full burden of her sins before him. And my friends, so do we. That is the heart of the Christian gospel. As J.M. Boyce puts it, Christianity presents a twofold revelation. There is the revelation of God, primarily in Jesus Christ, and there is the revelation of ourselves, and the two are related. No one has ever seen God unless at the same time he has seen himself as a sinner. Christianity begins by bringing people to the truth about their own depraved condition to convince them of their need for Jesus Christ. See, we have to realize that we're dying of thirst before we can crave living water. And that's true for each of us this morning. No matter if you're listening to this and you're still making a decision about Jesus, maybe you're not quite there yet where you've, you've put your faith in him. Whether you're in that spot this morning or, or whether you've been a Christian for 30 years, sin is present in each of our lives. It is an everyday experience for each and every one of us. None of us are immune. The Bible makes that abundantly clear. Which means that we... We really need to get used to having these uncomfortable conversations with Jesus. We need to get used to being, being asked about these things in our lives. Not, not because Jesus is wanting to, to berate us, but because he's wanting us, he's wanting us to realize that we're thirsty and that we need living water from him. During the worship set, if you you watched what we recorded for you to worship with this morning. Olivia read from Psalm 32. She read these verses. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. That's where we all would like to be, right? Forgiven. Our transgression, our sin, washed away, wiped clean, in right standing before God. But how do we get there? Well, the, the psalmist continues. When I kept silent, when I kept silent about my sin, when I held it in, when I refused to talk about it with the Lord, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For night and day my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. These verses make it pretty plain that there's not much benefit in keeping our sins hidden from God. All the blessing comes when we openly bring them to the Lord and receive forgiveness from Him. There's really no comparison in these verses. But my friends, if, if we are going to say to ourselves, as the psalmist does, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, then it means we need to stop being so uncomfortable with these conversations. We need to start being comfortable talking about sin in our lives. Now the good news is, Jesus treats us with the same patience and care and loving kindness as he does with this Samaritan woman. I mean, just notice how Jesus treats her. He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't condemn her. He doesn't run away from her aghast and sickened. Do you realize that the Jewish law would have demanded that this woman be stoned to death because of the sins in her life? But Jesus sees her through different eyes. He looks on her with compassion and a care for her eternal soul. And he looks at us the exact same way. As I wrap this sermon up, I'm reminded of another encounter Jesus has with another sinner in Mark chapter 10. A young man this time, who is wealthy and prominent. A man who comes to Jesus asking about eternal life. He's asking about living water. And Jesus responds by saying, Well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud... Honor your father and mother. To which the young man replies, Well, I've done all of those and I've done them since birth. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the commandments that Jesus names to this rich young ruler in, in these verses are the ones that pertain to people. You know, the Ten Commandments are broken down into two sections, right? The, the first section deals with how we interact with God and the second section deals with how we interact with, with people with one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The, the Ten Commandments are summed up in those two statements. But notice that, notice that Jesus only names the commandments that deal with the neighbor, deal with loving other people. He doesn't, he doesn't bring up the ones about loving God. Specifically, that we will have no other gods before him. You see, I think in the story of the rich young ruler, Jesus is doing the exact same thing as he does with the Samaritan woman. He sees the young man's heart. He knows the sin that lurks there, the love of money and power and prestige. He knows that this young man indeed has gods that he is worshipping ahead of Yahweh, ahead of the Lord God Almighty. And so Jesus calls the young man to sacrifice his God in order to have eternal life. 
It's the exact same story. But what stands out to me from this story in Mark chapter 10 is what, is what we're told in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. See, I think the exact same thing happens with the Samaritan woman. Jesus looks at her and her sin and her immorality and her separation from God and he loves her. And he invites her to confess her sin and receive from him forgiveness. And he does the same thing for us. We're going to have communion together in just a moment. But before we do, I would encourage you to take a moment and ask Jesus if there's any uncomfortable conversations you need to have with him. Ask him if there is any sin in your life that you need to clear up. That you need to, to confess to him. So that you would receive the blessings that, that Psalm 32 lays out for us. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we pray that in these moments that you would, you would give us the courage to have any uncomfortable conversations we need to have with you. And that as we come to the communion table together, Jesus, we would do so with a clean slate. That we would do so having confessed our sins and repented of them and having received your forgiveness, the forgiveness that you died on a cross to bring us. Forgiveness that is purchased by your broken body and your shed blood. Forgiveness that is, is brought to our lives because you wash us clean in the blood of your sacrifice. And so we, we come before you in this moment and we ask you, we ask you if there are any uncomfortable conversations we need to have with you in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.